Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Wendell Elamine James Show. This evening, we have uh, a show that we're going to talk to children of long-time offenders, which have become adults in prison. And we're going to have a narrator, uh, Lynn. I'm going to turn it over to her. She can open up, and we can uh, start our show. Welcome to the show. Thank this you. Everybody. Lynn, come on. Thank you. Ran you on and allowed you to, to take over the show. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. So um, tonight we're going to hear some stories, some real-life stories that illustrate how these two people, Wendell and Ernest, um, have found ways not only to survive decades of incarceration, but also ways to thrive in the face of adversity by lifting up their identities as parents, as fathers in this case. You're going to hear about how behind the locked doors and inside the confinement of prison walls, these two individuals found opportunities for recovery from trauma. And you will hear in their stories how they cultivated resiliency and hope while living under the relentless oppressive conditions of incarceration. So we're going to start. I'm just going to ask some questions and um, answer them as honestly as you can in the way that feels most comfortable to you. And if it's uncomfortable, let me know and we can move on, okay? Okay. So um, for Wendell and Ernest, maybe Wendell, we can start with you. If you could... Um, Please very briefly state the reason you went to prison and how old you were when you went to prison and how old your children were. Okay. Uh, my name is Wendell Elamine James. I uh, went to prison for first degree murder. I was found guilty of first degree murder. Mm -hmm. And um, I did tw serve 27 years and nine months. I was released in uh, 2015. I've been on a little over a year, maybe 17 months. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, I have uh, a total of five children. And how old were your children when you well, were my, went to prison? My oldest daughter was, I think she was 15 mm -hmm. when I went to prison. I was 35 years old when I went to prison. My oldest daughter was 15. I believe uh, Rashawn was 14. My son was 12. And I had a daughter, I think she was 13. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I went to prison. My son, I had another daughter was Nine. Okay. Yeah. Well, I went to prison, yeah, so I, uh, I, left, a, I left a family. Yes. Yeah. You did? Traumatized family. Mm hmm. Yeah. I didn't have to, have, have to live without a father. Mm hmm. Yeah. But yeah. Thank you. Ernest, how old were you when you went to prison, and how old? The, the reason, uh, and the reason you went to prison. I have, uh, I have, I've served two prison terms. Uh, the first time I went to prison, was uh, I was what 20, 21. I went in 1962, did nine years and got out in 71. Uh, the second time, uh, my commitment with Pence was in 1982. And I went for uh, two counts of second degree murder and one of attempt. And Mignon, uh Ernest's daughter. How mm. old were you when your father was incarcerated? 82, so mm, probably about 18, 19, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, somewhere in there. Okay. Um, Ernest, how do you think Mignon was impacted by your incarceration? Um, I can't, um, I'm not my, uh, Mignon's biological father. Uh, I entered into her life when she was um, about 12 or 13 years old. And uh, we became very, very close. And there was um, a lot of trust between uh, myself and Mignon. And um, whenever she had an issue or something was bothering her, um, we would talk, and uh, our thing was, at the time, I had a uh, Ford van that uh, was all tricked out and was nice inside, and uh, I would come down, pick her up, uh, we'd get in the van, I would go to Joe Gilmore's liquor store, and, <laughs> and I would get a half a pint of brandy and a Pepsi, and we'd get on the freeway and just ride and talk, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, the trust thing, uh, to trust me 
and look for me uh, for guidance and to have that snatched away, okay, uh, was you know, very impactful, very impactful. Uh, and it took me uh, a number of years to realize that because my first few years in prison, uh, I just dealt with me. Mm -hmm. And I rationalized it and said, you know, hey, she's going to be all right. Mm -hmm. you no, know, but way down the road, you know, after I've been in like 14, 15 years and I start, you know, working on myself and, and looking at how, how my behavior had exponentially impacted a lot of people. And I started with my family because I have a son also. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, we did the last little session with him. And uh, I had a conversation once with my son, and I told him, I said, you know what, uh, Mignon's really mad at me, right? And he said, what are you talking about? Mignon loves you. I said, I know. I said, but I left her. You know, and I knew that uh, that is in her mind. It's not how it happened or when it happened, but hey, Ernest left. Okay. Mignon, how, how did it impact you when mm -hmm. Ernest left? Okay, we're opening the door. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, at first I was in shock because I didn't believe any of it. Mm -hmm. um, for the longest time, I was in shock. So, yeah, I got into some things that I probably never would have gotten into had he been here. He kept me out of a lot of trouble. <laughs> when he um, first came into our lives, I just thought he was this plumber who um, was trying to go out with my mom. And I was like, he can't even dress. Look at him. He's all grubby and dirty. But his son was cute. I was like, Mom, can we take him home? <laughs> I just wanted to take Kisu home. <laughs> but um, then one night he came over to take my mom out. <laughs> and he was sharp as a tack. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Guess he can take her out. Mm. <laughs> yeah, but he was always there for us. I remember when he worked on the Alaskan Pipeline and was always sending cool things home. I remember when he went to live in New York and came back with all the latest dances and took us all out to the Palladium because mm. that was the only place we were old enough to get into. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, his, his departure, his sudden departure, definitely um, blew me out the door. Because he was a person I always talked to. Uh -huh. so. And now it's gone. Now it's gone. Yeah. So. Did you and, have an opportunity to visit him? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Once once he came back from abroad. Because um, he was in England for, what, two, three years maybe? Yeah, about two and a half. Uh-huh. Um, Incarcerated in England? Or? Mm -hmm. Yes. I got arrested oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we would all go down and visit with him. And then when I got older and moved back from Washington, D.C., I would, um, and I was in L.A., so on my way from L.A. to San Francisco, I would always stop and try and see as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wendell, how about you? How, how did your incarceration, imp have you had a chance to talk to your kids about yes. this since they've been adults? Yes, yes, yeah. It affected them immensely. Uh, my daughter, it, 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 my daughter was raped during my incarceration. And uh, I found out uh, years after my incarceration, I, uh, when I first got arrested, I went to prison, I got a shoe term. January 10th, 1990, I got a shoe term. What does old. that mean? That's gone. You went, you get arrested in prison, and you go to jail in prison. Oh, okay. So that's, that's the whole. Got it. <laughs> yeah. So you're doing time in prison. And, uh, yeah. So I got arrested. I was, I was a bad guy. And I, I went to a shoe program in Corkland. My daughter come, came to see me. And uh, came to see me with my wife and my, my mother. And she said, uh, I was behind the glass with the, the phone. She said, Dad, I need to talk to you. Me and my daughter are real, real close. I said, well, I can't talk to you, baby, other than on the phone. I said, what is it? She said, no, Dad, I need to talk to you. It's, it's you. I need to talk to you. And I said, well, I can't talk to you right now, baby. You know, tell me on the phone. I, I can't tell you on the phone. I didn't mm -hmm. talk to you. So that went on for for a while, about two hours, mm. doing the visiting. And I said, well, I'll talk to you later on. When I get somewhere, I'll be able to talk to you. She said, that's okay, Dad. That's okay. Right? So years later, 
when I made it to the, the main line in Pelican Bay, she came to visit me. And uh, I asked her, I said, what is it that you wanted to tell me, Sean? That's all right, that's okay. At that time, she was she had made, uh, she, I think she was 17 years old. Then. That's okay, Dad. So I said, ain't nothing. It's okay. So I let it go. So years later, I was in Old Folsom. This was maybe been, she might have been 17 years old, nine, uh, 18 years old then. She came to visit me. I said, Shana, what was that that you wanted to tell me? Years ago, when I was in home. She said, Dad, there's nothing. I said, no, no, let me know, baby. I've been bothering me all these years. She said, Dad, I was raped. And the feeling that I had, I like, whoa, my baby, I wasn't there for it. Right? She said, that's okay, Dad, I took care of it, it's okay, you know. So that I live with that, right? But the effect that it had on them, it changed her. I mean, it actually changed her, changed her bad. She had relationships with men and different things. It changed her. My son, he got arrested uh, shortly after I, I was in, in prison. He uh, <clears throat> he wanted to be like his dad. Okay, his dad. I was a bad character before I went to prison, but I'd never been to prison. I had never been to prison until this time. I got a first degree murder. I got a life sentence. But he told his mother, "I want to be about like my dad." Mm -hmm. And then his mother kept telling him, "Well, your dad never went to jail. He didn't go to jail. He went to jail one time. He got a life sentence." So my son, he got arrested for for selling weed. <laughs> They gave him a, uh, I said, drug diversion. Uh, what was it? Joint suspended. Yeah. yeah. I got him on paper. He gave him a joint suspended. So he got out. And, 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 and if you get out on joint suspended, you, you got like, I, I beat him. I, I can keep on doing what I'm doing. Well, he got arrested again. And he got an 18 month shoe program. I mean, an 18 month sentence. Mm -hmm. At that time, I was in Pelican Bay. He was in Old Folsom. Right? So I got the word that he was in Old Folsom. Where I had previously been, mm -hmm. but now I'm in Pelican Bay. Mm -hmm. But I got another beat up. I said, My goodness, what have I done? I ruined a family. My daughter getting raped. My son is in the system now. You know, so that escalated. It went on and on and on. So my son got left. He got out. Went back to San Francisco, and uh, he was doing good. A couple years later, I called home and they had him again. This time he did eight years in the feds. Ruin the family, right? So, I had another daughter, my third daughter. She got hit by a school bus. Mm -hmm. you know, almost killed her. You know, what have I done to her family? You know, so all this coming home, then I gotta see my children. <coughs> I gotta sit down to them and apologize to them for all what I did because I did this. If I hadn't been here, that might have not happened. Might not. Might may have had, but it might not have happened. So I come home and sit with all my children, and uh, they, they excuse me. Dad, it's not your fault. You couldn't do nothing about it. What's well, not your fault? You live the life that you live. That's what happened. You know, me and my children are very, very, very close today. I talk to my son every day. Mm -hmm. Every calls me every day. Great. Religiously, every day. My daughter called me, every, if not every day, every other day. That's great. I talk to my children. What do you think, um, what do you think contributed to your ability, uh, this is a question for both of you, to reflect on um, you as a parent, as a father, while you were incarcerated? What, what circumstances contributed to having an environment for you to do that? I imagine prison is not a place that... Uh, you know, supports a lot of self-reflection and growth. Mm -hmm. what, did, what, what did you do to do that work for yourself? Well, for me, I didn't... Um, I didn't look at it. And um, quite different from Wendell, uh, I still haven't fully addressed it. You know, I know I'm not. I'm not saying that to brag. I'm, I'm saying that because that's. It's a shame I haven't. You know. Um, in in coming to the realization of the harm 
that I had caused my kids and I had forfeited the right to raise them mm. and to, to be there for them. And for years, my rationale was um, they'll be all right. You know, uh, you know, they abused the mom, they'll yeah. be all right. And um, when I started looking into uh, really, you know, uh, the harm that had been done, it was, uh, it's a very shameful realization. You know, I think that what happens is with, with people that are out in the streets and, and, and we are doing what we are doing and we all love our kids, you know, that's, that's a given. We all love our kids. But when we're out doing what we're doing, we're not thinking about the at kids. All, at all. You know, and when I, when I look around at, at things that are happening uh, with, with, the, with law enforcement and with our black youth, whatever, whatever, uh, I have a little different, a different take on that, you know, because uh, I feel that uh, myself, my generation, and other generations, we have set our kids up for that by not being there for them. We failed them. You know, we failed them. You know, when you have when you have kids that are out doing what they're doing, and they are second and third generation mm -hmm. you know, into that. That's that's really sad. You know, yes, economics, racism has a lot to do with it, but individual decision making has a great deal to do with it. Mignon, what do you think about that, what your dad's saying? Well, I'm listening to what he's saying, and it's kind of hard for me to, well, I understand he's talking about other children, because in all fairness, even though he wasn't at home with us, we actually came out pretty good. Um, despite all of the uh, stuff that we went through, my brother was out there in the life and doing stuff. I was making wrong choices in terms of who I was dating and substances and exploration and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, when you look at all of us, he has a son who's completing his um, plumbing apprenticeship program. Um, he has a stepdaughter who is a lawyer. Mm -hmm. He has one who is in public administration and working at City College. Mm -hmm. And then he has me, Miss Cuckoo, the social worker. <laughs> so in all, in all, you know, despite it all, you know, did, were, was it a significant loss for us? Sure. I was just sitting here thinking about a time after he was gone when we had no money. And my mom and I were driving around trying to figure out what to do. And I was like, well, why don't we take the clocks? The antique clocks and take them to a pawn shop mm -hmm. and the best we ended up going to a pawn shop to get some money because there was no money my siblings didn't know that there was a lot that they didn't know even though they think they do there's a lot that went on that some of them never knew about um like i stayed behind i i could have gone to school sooner i could have finished city college a lot sooner but I was there working and giving my mother money so that the rest of them could do what they needed to do. You really filled that role. And right, and even in his when absence, even mm -hmm. when I came home from Howard mm -hmm. and um, was working in L.A., I was still sending money home. Mm -hmm. So that's the part that people miss. Right. So, yeah. so what you're saying is, even though all you and all your siblings really turned out really well and healthy people at this point there were periods of time where it was very very difficult and yeah. you as the eldest really filled that role that that your dad left a, yeah. kind of a gap when he left some we, we had to we had to eat you had to <laughs> so. I, have a, I have a question okay I have a question I have a for, question. for Mignon or for Wendell? No, for Wendell. Okay. Wendell is um, you have uh, two or three kids mm -hmm. and you are away from them for quite a while Okay. This is a two-part question. Okay. Once, once you came out 
and was out here and with the kids and seeing how they were living and the relationship they had with each other, were you satisfied? Was I satisfied? With their relationship with each other? I was. Okay. I was. Okay. The reason, reason, reason why I ask that is that I, I have, I experienced it differently, mm -hmm. uh, right? In that, uh, just like Mian said, uh, yes, even in, in, in spite of adversity, you know, they, they, they buckled down and, and, and did what they had to do. Uh, and coming out, uh, with the one thing that I did know, beyond a reasonable doubt, I knew that they all loved me, mm -hmm. okay, and they all respect me. I knew that. And once I got out, you know, I was just so happy. I mean, I was out less than 36 hours, and everybody was there. I was over at 890 over at Walton House. Everybody showed up, right? Uh, but then I, the relationship they had with each other was less than desirable, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that greatly impacted me because, one, it surprised me, and secondly, I knew if I had not went to prison, it wouldn't have been that way. Okay, you no. Know, I, 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 I was, you know, yeah, yeah. I removed myself from it. All right, and um, their mom, uh, she had passed uh, about eight, ten years previous uh, with cancer, right? And so, with with love, concern, and guilt. I wanted to change it. Mm -hmm. I wanted to change the relationship they had with each other, you know. And uh, I wanted to have a, a, a sit down, a family meeting, and, and 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 the whole shot. And what what changed that my thinking was that uh, I went to a meeting uh, at eight ninety around around this issue, and I realized that. Whatever relationship that my kids have and whatever way that they deal with each other, they've been doing that for 30 years, man. Mm -hmm. It ain't nothing I can do with it. I was on the eve of alienating myself with everybody. Well, that's what's going to happen. All right? And so I really continue. I mean, I really, 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 really feel bad about it, but but what I did was I realized the only thing that I can do is treat them and love them as individuals. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't, I can't change nothing. Yeah. You know, it is what it is. And is that, do you think, different than any other parent feels? Maybe you don't know that answer because you're not. Yeah, I can't, you know, I can't, I can't, I can't, uh, I can't speak for anybody else. I, I have talked with other lifers. Mm -hmm. um, on this subject, uh, some just have some have the attitude of like, "Hey, they grown. Right. Whatever now, happens, now, happens." Now, now I can say, as you just stated, that when you came home, you wanted to get everybody together and everybody talk, and you know, like a family, like a family does. I, I'm, I haven't been able to do that yet. No, I haven't been able to do that yet. Get everybody in the same room talk. No, I haven't been able to do that. What, what's what's hard about getting that's, that? That's that's that. It, it's not it's not being done. It, it won't be done. We had we got we had last Thanksgiving and last Christmas together, and I tried to get it done then. It's, 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 it's not it's not going to happen. Now, I don't know what happened between them while I was gone, but as far as the relationship that I see with them, it's okay. But as far as sit, sitting down and talking, no, I haven't been able to do that yet. You know, we had we had uh, we had I think it was who was I think it was either. Was somebody's birthday or a holiday and we was all together mm -hmm. okay and um and i brought it up you know of having a family meeting mm -hmm. and, and just this this talking you know and um everyone uh, appeared to be receptive to the idea right but it didn't happen and i, I internally i revisited it and it was it was a bittersweet thing Right, it was a bittersweet thing in that everyone seemed to be receptive to the idea out of respect for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. out of respect for mm-hmm. me. You know, and they, no, wasn't nobody going to say, oh, I don't want to do that or whatever, whatever, you know. Mm-hmm. Everybody was agreeable and everybody was very cordial. Mm-hmm. But, you know, they know they wasn't going to do it. You know? mm-hmm. and it. And it never happened, you know, and, and I accepted that. I accepted that, you know. You know, yeah. so. you, you know I'm, I want to say this. We, we, this, this we, we, we're having a good session here, real, real good. And I don't want it to end, okay? But we're going to have to end this and we're going to have another session. Because this, this is it's going to be a two part, okay. part one and part two. Because this has got uh, some feelings, some feelings are coming out. And we want to bring it on. And so we want to stop this now. We want to start back on part two. So uh, stay tuned for part two. Uh, we have the part one and part two of this, of this show. And uh, I want to thank everybody for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me.